we're bringing in the expert. Today's million dollar mentor was the head of SWAT for 17 years. He's the host of his own television show. He has overseen more than a thousand arrests and today serves as a consultant to billion dollar businesses across America. And today he's here to show you how to negotiate any deal. So would you please help me welcome our good friend and million dollar mentor, Corey Jones. Welcome. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. My friend, thank you so much. Over to you. I, I'm looking forward to learning and I've got my iPad ready to go and ready to take a ton of notes. Well, take notes. Take notes. Definitely take notes. Daniel, thank you for that awesome introduction. I really appreciate it. Welcome, everybody, to this Million Dollar Mentor session. Again, my name is Corey Jones. Uh, if you need to get a hold of me, you can see my website over. I can't tell us my left or right because everything's backwards. But you see my website and you see my social media handle right under me, at SafetyManCO. Uh, like Daniel said, I was ahead of SWAT. I had to negotiate a lot of things, whether it be a crisis negotiation where I literally had hostages' lives in the balance, whether it be someone holding themselves hostage or holding themselves at a danger where they were going to hurt themselves or merely talking somebody into handcuffs without having to use force. It's 2022. You watch the news in America. Force is not something that we want to do anymore. So I love Daniel's three laws of negotiations. Number one, definitely everything is negotiable. And that's going to be my first law. I'm going to give you eight steps for negotiation today. So if you can go write down, if you're taking notes, one to eight, we're going to give you eight steps. The second law, unlimited possibilities. That's definitely something you're going to, you're definitely going to follow. The third law, and, and I'm following the third law almost over overemphasizing the third law today is ne is negotiate is a uh, preparation. I have my iPad right in front of me, just under the camera view with my notes because I don't want to miss anything. And then I have backup paper notes just in case my iPad crashes or turns off. So I have to be prepared. One of my hashtags is always be ready. So with that, remember number one is everything is a negotiation. Now, when I give you these eight steps, I don't want you to think that these eight steps are linear, meaning that you have to do step one, then we progress to step two, then we progress to step three. It doesn't always work that way. Obviously, we're probably going to start with number one because we have to determine that we're in a negotiation. And then there's some, some things under that that we're going to talk about. Then we may move to step two, step three, step four. And then you'll see there'll be some time in there. We're going to reassess our progress. We're going to reassess what's going on. And we may have to backtrack and change our tactics, change the way we're going. So these steps may not be linear, but I, I would submit to you that you're probably going to use all eight or a version of all eight of these. And I, I want to see you know, some, some people raising their hands and, uh, and throwing stuff in the chat box so we can determine if you've used these before, if you wish you had used these before, or if you plan on using these tomorrow at some time in the future. So number one, as Daniel said, everything is a negotiation. And when I used to coach this, I used to coach that there's three types of people. But that's boxing in. That's saying that people are always the same all the time. So we modified that language. And now we say there's three types of behavior. There's three types of behavior that the, the person that we're negotiating with or discussing this with is exhibiting, right? Then those three types of behavior are the easy one. We know they're compliant. This is the person that we picked up the phone and said, hello, safety man. Yes, I need your services to teach me how to negotiate or to verbally de-escalate or to manage crises, right? That one's probably going to be compliant, right? At some point, I may have to start talking about terms and so forth, but they're going to be pretty much a known compliant. The second type of behavior is going to be that unknown compliance. That's the one that we're pitching. That's the one that answers that door. That's that gatekeeper, as Daniel mentioned. That's that person where we're not sure what's going to happen. We made it past the gatekeeper. Now we're at the decision maker and we don't know where they're going to go. So that's that unknown compliance, right? And then the one we're going to be focusing on today, the behavior type that we're going to be focusing on today is the non-compliant. Well, we're right out of the shoot. We know that this person is like, probably don't need your services and I'm certainly not going to pay that for it. 
right? But we're not going to give up yet. We're not going to give up. Our job, the whole purpose of this is to try to win that person. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to parallel the business type of negotiation with a very specific incident that I was involved in as a SWAT commander and as the shift commander with an incident that we had an emotionally disturbed person, someone who was in a mental crisis who we had to arrest, who is in our station. So I'm going to parallel both of those while we're talking about this. And I'm going to show you how there's not that much difference between a crisis negotiation and law enforcement or SWAT and the negotiation that we're talking about that I'm doing now as a private business owner every time that I talk to a client, a potential client or a past client. All right. So just to let you know about this person we had in custody, he was violent. We had to use force to take him into custody. He was very uncooperative. He was threatening my coworkers. He was threatening with violence. He was threatening me with violence. He was hurting himself. He was smashing his head on the cinder block wall in our custody room. And he was not a small individual. He was a very big guy. He was off his medications. He wasn't wake. He didn't wake up a bad person. He just was off his medications. He was acting out of character and he was in severe crisis. So keep that in your mind because we're going to continually going back to paralleling what that individual was going through and what I had to do to negotiate with him. And then what we're talking about negotiating with our clients in the future. So number one is everything is a negotiation and there's three types of behavior, the known, the unknown, and the non-compliant, right? So now we determine which type of behavior we're dealing with. So we have to determine what the goals of this negotiation are. We have to determine what the goals are. And there's two goals in every negotiation, right? There's our goal. And then there's the person we're negotiating with this, their goal. So we have to determine what those goals are. And I'm going to jump forward a little bit. I'm going to jump back. And that's going to come from active listening, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. But we have to determine what those goals are. Are the goals tangible? And I think Daniel mentioned this. Are the goals tangible? Is it a dollar amount? Is it a salary? Is it the fact that somebody's actually going to have, keep, maintain a job, a position, a level of advancement? Is it a sale that you're going to make? Is it, a, is it something tangible where it's a number? Like you see on TV where they pass the piece of paper back and forth. They write a number down. Then you write a number down. Is it something that's tangible like that? Or is it intangible? Is it something that's a little bit intangible, like negotiating the times for appointments? It's kind of tangible. But it's not. It's kind of like we got to get just... I just want to get to talk to you. Can, can, we just, can we just talk? Can we set up a time to talk, whether it be Zoom, in person, or, or, or via telephone? So we have to determine what the goals are, whether they're tangible or intangible. And now this is really important. Under that determine the goals, we have to determine the importance for both parties, us and the person we're, we're, we're negotiating with. We have to determine the consequences if we fail to attain those goals, okay? We have to determine the level of consequences. So with Daniel's initial example, a $10 consequence one day, not that big a deal. A $10 consequence over several years can be a very big deal, right? It can be a very big deal. So we have to determine the consequences of both parties. So paralleling that emotionally disturbed person that we had in, in custody in my station, his goal, at that time was the immediate relief of his emotional and physical anxiety and pain. That was his goal. He didn't care that he was under arrest. He didn't care that he could potentially go to jail. He didn't care that we were potentially going to take him to the hospital. All he wanted was to feel better. I don't know if anybody here knows anyone who's ever had a panic attack or has ever suffered from anxiety, but when you're in that state, there is nothing more important than getting rid of that. So once I determined that that was his goal, that's all that I was shooting for. So we have to determine the importance of it. Now, what was important to me? What was my goal? My goal was A, for him to stop injuring himself by smashing his head against the concrete wall in my station. My goal was for him to stop threatening to assault my officers. My goal was to get him to stop spitting at my officers. My goal was to get him 
to be able to let me sit next to him so I could establish a personal communication with him and me not feel in danger that he was going to injure me. And finally, my goal was to avoid a potential lawsuit for allowing this person in custody to be injured or injure one of my officers, because then that's a financial goal. And we know how much that can lead to. So we have to determine the goals of every party and we have to determine the importance. How important is winning or losing? How important is to attaining or not attaining? So that's number two is determine the goals. Number three is now we determine what the goals are. Why aren't, why aren't they agreeing? So we have to determine the barriers. We have to determine what is potentially preventing the person from immediately just saying, yes, I will buy the DVD player. Yes, I will agree to meet at noon. What is preventing that? What is the barrier? And the barriers are usually caused, almost always caused by one of two things, something that's inside of them or something that we're adding to the negotiation that is causing them to go, to go, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't think I like this. So we have to determine the barriers. Did we say or do something that created them being uncomfortable? Were we too pushy? Did we go right? Did we go too fast? You know, were we unclear? Did we misquote something? Or is it something that's inside of them that that's preventing them from doing it? Do they just not like me? Do they not like the, they actually not like the product? Do they misunderstand what the product is that we're trying to, to, to pitch them? Do they misunderstand it? Do they not know all the facts? Do they have a misconception? So we have to determine what those barriers are. You know, everybody has that, that misconception of a used car dealer. The used car dealer will do or say anything to get you into that used car. So we all go in with our barriers up, right? I know everything you're going to tell me is a lie, so I'm not listening to it. I did my homework. I know what it is. And that used car salesman's goal is to get rid of those barriers, handle the objections, right? So we have to determine the barriers, and then we have to figure out how we're going to get rid of those barriers. So again, back to that emotionally disturbed person that we had in custody. So what were the barriers that preventing him from complying? The barriers were, unfortunately, I had officers that were working with me that were unnecessarily escalating the situation. They were almost antagonizing the individual. They were taking it personal that he was calling them names, that he was using profanity, that he was spitting at them. And, and they were going right back. They got sucked in emotionally to this situation. And fortunately, because I, I'm trained in verbal de-escalation, and uh, Daniel will tell you, I'm just a nice, easygoing guy. I, I didn't take it personally. I was in charge, so I, I couldn't. I had my chief of police, my deputy chief of police, the lieutenants, the entire command staff watching this. This is on video. It's on body camera. I had the whole world potentially watching this, right? So I had to make sure that I was going to make sure that I wasn't going to add anything to it. So the barriers preventing his immediate cooperation were my coworkers that were antagonizing the, the individual, notwithstanding his own inability to make really sound decisions due to him not being on his medication and being emotionally disturbed. So now we determine what those barriers were. Number four, obviously, we're going to want to remove those barriers. We have to remove the barriers, right? We want to remove the fear. If there's fear of making a deal, there's fear of spending this amount of money. If there's fear of, of holding hands with another business, if there's fear of somebody saying, well, you have a business coach. If, if there's fear, we have to remove that fear. We have to remove the loss of confidence that they may have had, right? We have to remove the fear that they're going to have to spend a little bit of money today and maybe that's going to benefit them in one year, two years, five years. We have to remove that fear. We have to be crystal clear of the mutually beneficial goal that we're negotiating with this client, this potential client, or this person. So we have to remove the barriers. We have to move that fear, that loss of confidence. Explain to them that money spent today may mean money earned tomorrow. And that potential loss of respect. If, if they're making a deal with somebody and, and they have a misconception, they may feel that they're going to lose respect. If they acquiesce, if, if they think that safety man, that Corey came in and won this negotiation and they didn't win, they may feel that they lost respect. So we have to remove that. We have to remove those barriers. So that's number, number four. Number five 
we're constantly doing number five throughout this whole event is we're constantly assessing our progress and we're making those immediate adjustments, immediate adjustments. We're assessing the progress and we're making those immediate adjustments, right? So again, my emotionally disturbed person in headquarters, as I'm assessing it, I realized that there was nothing that I was going to say or do that was going to be able to get this individual to calm down and say, okay, I'll get in the ambulance and go to the hospital. It was not going to happen. Not without the use of force. So we developed a plan B. The plan B was we were going to have the medics come in, the paramedics, and actually give him a sedative via injection to basically render him uh, unconscious, just like when you're going to get a surgery. And that's really unprecedented in, in my area is forcing somebody against their will to be administered a medication that's going to render them unconscious. I have never seen it happen before or since, but that was a plan that we came up with. We got it approved and I had to negotiate to get him to allow us to give him an injection. I had to do that. So number six, how did I get there? I was actively listening. I was actively listening to everything that he was saying, both his verbal statements and his other nonverbals, his body language, his facial expressions. If he would tense up or relax, all those things I was trying to read and I was trying to reward myself by saying, okay, that was good. That calmed him down. That was bad. That made him more upset. That made him more agitated. So I had to actively listen and pay attention to the verbal and other nonverbals of the person that I'm negotiating with. You're going to see it in their face. You're going to see the, mm -hmm, or the, you know, you're going to see that. We all know it. We all know it when we see it, but we have to pay attention to it, tie it to something that just happened, assess, evaluate, and, and re, readdress that person with that. We want to stress calming. And we want to reassure that this is a mutually beneficial deal. This is a mutually beneficial negotiation that we're working on. When we're actively listening, like I see you doing now, I see the heads nodding, right? I, I see the eyes open. I see the people taking notes. That all shows me that you're actively listening. If in the middle of this, you saw me pick up my iPhone while, while Daniel was talking and I'm doing this, right? Certainly not actively paying attention, right? If I yawn, if I look away, if I interrupt, right, I'm not actively listening when I'm doing that. So we have to project that, mm -hmm, uh-huh, I see. All right, tell me more. Don't want to be fake. We want to make it the way we normally are, but we want to project that tactical empathy, we call it. We're using empathy, which is just us putting ourselves in that person's shoes, in that person's position on the other side of that table, on the other side of that screen, on the other side of that phone, we're putting ourselves in that position to determine what is it that they're thinking based on what I'm saying and presenting, right? And we want to be calm and reassuring. And I said that before, and I'm stressing it. We want to be calm and reassuring, calm and reassuring. So number six is that active listening. And while we're actively listening, things are going to pop into our head. And this one concept is something new to me that I just learned from reading a book is we want to establish no-go zones, something that it's a, it's a no-go. There's going to be times when this negotiation, somebody's going to say or do something, and it's just going to be a no. You know, at this point, there's nothing you can say or do that, that, that's, going to, that's going to work. And we have to establish a no-go zone on that, whether it be internally something that I can no longer negotiate below this number. I can no longer negotiate effectively below these terms. You know, we're sliding the papers back and forth and the person's number is just not a number that, that we can meet and they're dead set against it. I have to establish a no-go zone. I can't do it. So I might have to end the negotiation or if it's something that, that Corey, that safety man is adding to the situation that's making it a no-go, Maybe I have to do what's called a tap out and get another negotiator to come in and, and finish this negotiation. Maybe something personal happened. Maybe I, I created a situation where it's like, I don't trust you. I don't like you. I don't believe you. It, I have a negative taste in my mouth because of, of how this started. Maybe somebody else can help. Okay. With that person I had in custody, 
we had to finish it. I could have gotten another negotiator, but fortunately I didn't need it at that time, but I was prepared to do that. And I've done it in situations since then. So we have to establish those no-go no -go zones, whether they're internal, or external, and either be prepared to end or change negotiators. Number seven, we're gonna to drive to compliance. So everything we're doing is we're driving to compliance. We're handling those objections. We're removing those barriers. We're assessing and reevaluating. We're rewarding anything that the person says that is, is beneficial to the negotiation. We're, we're definitely stressing that if it was their idea or if it seems like their, it was their idea that we're rewarding that. People always feel better if they think that they're the one that came up with the potential solution. So we want to reward that. If they come up with something and it fits our plan, that's a fantastic idea. That's great. We want to reward that. That builds that positive, that positivity. That gives it a little endorphin rush. That makes them feel happy. It gives them a sense of control. It makes them more likely to give us cooperation or collaboration where they're actually going to help us make this goal. So we want to reward that positive movement. So with that emotionally disturbed person that I had in my headquarters, who was smashing his head against the wall, who was spinning against my officers, who was threatening the officers with violence, who, who I knew if he hurt himself, we were going to be sued. This was all on video. It was probably going to be on the, on the news. I, I didn't want any of those things to happen, right? So when I finally got him to allow us to sedate him, it, it, it was like a weight lifted off my shoulders. It was that I, I kind of almost won the negotiation. I had the medics on standby because I needed to be prepared to close the deal as soon as I got the yes before I gave him a chance to second guess it or to change his mental status. So before I offered that solution, I had to make sure I was prepared to close the deal just like that. So when he allowed us to sedate him, the benefit to him, which I continually stressed, was I'm going to give you something that's going to immediately lessen and eventually take away your physical and emotional stress and pain and discomfort. And the more I said that, and the more I would see him relax, and the more I would see him look at me when I said that, the more I kept driving to that compliance, right? So in number seven, I kept driving to compliance based on his body language and his verbals and other non-verbals to lessen his physical and emotional distress. So the same thing when we're negotiating with a potential client, a current client to retain that client or change the deal or sweeten the deal for us is we want to reward those positive things and we want to continually drive to something that's going to be mutually beneficial because nobody in this class is going to do something that's only beneficial to us and take advantage of our clients. We're always going to be a win-win because eventually at the end of a couple of years, we're going to have the reputation that the whole suite do is take advantage of our clients. We're selling lemons, right? We're the used car in, in America. We have something called lemons. It's the lemon law. If you sell a car, it's just so beat up and it needs repairs for the same thing more than three times. There's a law. In a lot of states, it says they have to take the car back for the full value. We don't want that reputation. There's been businesses that have been closed for having that reputation. All right. I'm going to pause right now for any questions. Is there anything that anyone has done in the past where they use any of these techniques before I give you the last one? Any of these techniques where they used in a, uh, in a negotiation in the past where they used any of these techniques with a success or they had a negotiation where they're like, you know what? Maybe if I had been doing that, maybe I would have gotten a better deal. Or finally, the question I'll ask is, is there a negotiation that you have coming up where you can see one, two, three, or some of these tactics or this technique or this process could be beneficial to you? Okay. Now, I, I want to give you the, the, my, my, my last one that I really, really like is number four, remove the barriers. You need to focus more on these areas. Definitely is removing those barriers. Thank you for that. Yeah, I definitely want to remove those barriers. The last one is, is really important. And there's been a lot of studies on this. And there's a podcast that I listen to with a doctor who, who really reinforces this is we want to celebrate victories. If we get a successful negotiation, I want you to celebrate that. I want you to share that. 
I want you as soon as possible within the policies of your organization, share that with as many people as you can. Call your significant other, call your, your boss, call your employer, call your team members, call your friends. I want you to share that. What that's going to do is they're going to ask you, well, how did you do that? What did you do? When I shared that story of how I talked this person into letting the, us give him an injection, you should have seen the faces of people I've been telling it to. Other law enforcement professionals are like, what? First off, they didn't even think that was legal. And then they're like, you actually got somebody to allow you to do that. And what that did is it reinforced in me. It gave me a positive endorphin release. And it, it's a proven fact that if you have an endorphin release attached to an event, you're more likely to remember it and the steps that you took to attain that, that goal, that, that, that win, right? Share that with people. If you're able to post it on social media, maybe redacting or, 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 or putting, uh, you know, not putting all the information on there, but the fact that you just closed a big deal and get those likes and those thumbs up and those hearts and all those things floating up. All those are important endorphin releases, all those. And plus it, it goes to show that you're effective at your, at your profession, but we want to get those endorphin releases. I want you to tie a positive emotion to a positive outcome in a negotiation that you had is what I want to do. So I just want to go back and review those, those eight steps that we're doing for, uh, for negotiation is, and again, as, as, as I first said, and as Daniel said, these aren't linear. We don't necessarily, as you can see now, does it make sense how they're not always necessarily linear that we go from one to two to three to four, and then we don't go back to five and we don't go back. You know, we, we, we continually reassess, right? Everything is a negotiation and there's three types of behavior, right? There's those, we know this person, we seem this person is going to be compliant. Then we don't know if this person is going to be compliant. We're at that networking event. We're saying, Hey, I'm safety man. You know, I consult billion dollar businesses on how to manage crises, how to verbally deescalate, how to keep yourself safe, how to increase your survival, how to increase your security. That's what I do. And, and I don't know what they're going to, what the reaction is going to be to that. And then we know that there's the non-compliance person like, ah, I don't need that. I don't need that. You know, we're, we're already safe. We're, we're, we're good to go. I, I don't need that. Well, I'm not taking no for an answer the first time. I'm going to continue to work on that because, you know, uh, that's just my personality. Number two is we want to determine the goals of this negotiation, their goal and my goal. What is our goal? And we know that we're prepared. We have it written down. We know what our goals are. We know what our bottom lines are. We know what our commission levels are. We know what the goals are. And then we have to find out what our, what our subjects goals are. What, what are his or her goals? What is it they need to be happy at the end of this deal to sign their ink on the bottom line of that piece of paper. So we have to determine their goals. Are they tangible or non-tangible? Is it something that we can actually do? Is it in our wheelhouse? Is it something that we can actually do? We have to determine the importance of a win or not a win, a loss, a win or a loss for both parties. Is this career ending? Is this reputation tarnishing? Is this a financial loss? Is this, a, is, what is the, the, the damage that could be done to the person if they lose and what could be done, what could we lose if we don't win this negotiation? And as I said, for me, injuries, lawsuit, potential, could be potentially career, end, career ending, could be me on the media. I, I didn't want any of those negative things. So I, I had to determine the importance of this negotiation. So that's what you need to do is determine the importance of winning this negotiation, right? And number three is we, what are the barriers? We're going to find out there's barriers. If we have that non-compliant person, they're non-compliant, I'm sorry, non-compliant behavior. They're being non-compliant for a reason. And we have to determine what that reason is. Is it something that we're doing or is it something that's, that, that, that they're exhibiting? And then we have to figure out what, what can we do to fix that? So we have to remove those barriers. Number four, remove the fear, remove any potential loss of confidence remove any, you know, uh, anything, remove anything that's, that's going to be a barrier, remove anything that's going to be a barrier, loss of money, loss of respect, loss of reputation, anything, and then remove any barriers from us. Okay. Am, am I going to lose my reputation if I don't win this negotiation? You know, my boss said, I'm giving you this, this easy one. This one's a shoe. When this, this person called, they said they want it. You go out there and you have to negotiate it. 
If I go back with a no, that's not going to be good for me. So I have to determine how important it is for me to, to, get, a, to get a yes in this. And then I'm continually, continuing. And this is actually being important all throughout law enforcement in America is assessing the need. I'm going to talk very specifically for one second about force. When we're applying force in a situation, we have to continually assess the need for force. And then when we are the resistance to that force diminishes, we have to immediately diminish our force. So it's going to be the same thing that we're doing when we're negotiating. We have to determine that resistance, uh, continually assess it, and then adjust our approach based on what's going on. And the whole time we're doing this, we're actively listening. We're actively, we're projecting an open and unbiased face. We're not judgmental. We're given those verbal and nonverbal cues. Okay, mm -hmm. I understand. Tell me more about that. All right, explain to me how, how this would benefit your company. Let's just say that we agree to everything you're saying now. How would this benefit you as a person? Or how would this benefit you as a company? Okay, and, and then listen. And they're going to give you cues. They're going to, they're going to, they're, and, and suddenly they're probably going to give you the answer and you just have to frame it in your goals and then, and then get, get it that way. Tell me more is a good one. Tell me more, get them talking, get them talking, let them think that they're in control. We're going to be empathetic. We're going to be in their shoes. We're going to try to examine how are they feeling? Why are they reacting the way they're doing? And then be prepared to set a no go zone. When is this going to have to end? When am I going to have to tap out? When may I have to change negotiators? Or when, when is this just a colossal waste of time? And now I'm creating a potential enemy. Whereas if I end it right now, you said, you know, I can see at this point that the terms I'm offering and the terms that you're looking for just aren't meeting right now. Maybe in the future, things can change and, and we can have a talk again. You know, I've done that with clients. And I, I, there's one client that I did that with. They would not come to my terms. I would not go any lower. They wound up getting sued. Had they had my services, they would not have gotten sued for a use of force. And they wound up employing me later for more money than, than they would have paid the first time had they employed me. So it, it cost them colossally because they didn't, they didn't come to my terms. And it actually made me feel good because they reached back out to me because they knew I knew what I was talking about, right? So we established a no-go zone. I ended it on a positive note the initial time, and they wound up reaching back out to me later you know, and this person is the head of, of the bar and restaurant association of my entire state and is now so confident in safety managers going to put me in front of, of a thousand bar and restaurant owners to help enhance their security and minimize their, their exposure for violating the alcoholic beverage control laws and potential violence on their situation because of that, right? So when we're doing all this, well, what are we doing? What am I doing right now? I'm driving to my goal. I'm driving to compliance. I don't, and I don't know how loud I am. If I'm yelling, give me a thumbs up if I'm yelling or if my volume is good. Give me, give me a thumbs up now if my volume is good, okay? Because for me, I think my neighbors are actually taking notes too. I'm not quite sure exactly how loud I am in here because there's no echo or anything like that. So number seven, we're driving to compliance. We're driving to compliance when we're doing this. Now I got a question to go back to number one is, is was Daniel's first rule of negotiation, everything is the negotiation. Everything is good. If, if I were to ask the, everybody in this, all right, we're going to go to dinner after this. That's going to be a negotiation. We're going to have seven different opinions or multiple different opinions. Well, I like this place. You like this place. You like this place. Okay. How important is it? it does somebody have dietary restrictions and that eliminates 50% of the places? That's going to be a no-go zone for them. So now we're already limited to instead of six, seven, eight choices, we're limited to two or three choices. So everything is a negotiation. And then we have to know the compliance behavior, where that person's behavior is on the compliance scale. Do we know they're probably going to be compliant? And there's just some fine tuning we have to do to get this. Do we not know? Do we have no idea? We have no idea how compliant they are in number one, because everything is a negotiation. Or do we know that this, they're, they're non-compliant? They're about ready to hang up the phone. You know, you're looking at the body language. They're turning their body away from us. They're about ready to walk away. They're looking at the exit. You know, you can see their finger hovering over the end button on the Zoom, right? We, we, we can see all those, those signs that they're non-compliant, and, and we have to know that. So that's going to be number one is everything is a negotiation, right? 
Everything is a negotiation. We're driving to compliance, cooperation, and collaboration. We're establishing and rewarding everything that that, that uh, client or that potential client does to, uh, to, to do something that makes us feel that, okay, we're getting somewhere now and we're rewarding it. Oh, thanks for saying that. Okay, that cleared a lot of stuff up for me. So now I kind of understand what it is that you're looking for. I'm glad you said that. So exactly now, based on that you told me that, you really don't need verbal de-escalation. You need crisis management, or you need this, or you need that. I'm glad you said that. And fortunately for you, Safety Man can offer that. And then finally, my favorite one is number eight. What I just got done doing two or three times is I'm celebrating that success. I'm celebrating that success. I'm creating an endorphin rush. When I see Daniel Tolson, who's a mentor to me, when I see him smile and give me a thumbs up, when I just shared two successes, when I see that, that creates an endorphin rush in me. And that makes me go, yeah, Corey, stick with your guns. Stick with the things that you've learned in the past. Stick with the things that your mentoring sessions with Daniel has told you. Stick with those things because they are working. So we want to share those successes with everybody, you know, as much as we can share those with everybody. Any other questions on that? I'm, I'm really going to wrap it up. I want to be conscious every time. And I know that Daniel is going to have some wrap up and some recap of that. If there, I'll be, I'll stay on the zoom. If there are any final questions on that, I'll, I'll be here. I'm going to turn it back over to Daniel to go ahead and wrap that up. But I really thank you for your attention. I thank you for showing me that you're actively listening. I love seeing those pencils. I love seeing those smiles. I love seeing those bright eyes. I love seeing the head nods. It just, it just, it's just so rewarding to me. Now, again, that's creating endorphin rushes in me. So Daniel, I'm going to mute myself. And uh, if you have any questions or want me to clear anything up, 